Hello, everyone. Welcome to our stream. We are excited to have you here today. Um, my name is Matthew. I'm one of the course staff for our online classes. And um, on the screen is Professor Chris Impey. Um, I'm going to say hello to everyone and uh, um, let Chris say uh, a welcome. Um, we are fiddling with some audio issues. If you're having trouble hearing us, please let me know in the chat. Um, I think everything is working now, but um, we are using a slightly different setup. And so we will uh, look for your comments in the chat. So the way this works is you post your, your questions in the chat on YouTube. I will grab them from there. Uh, we, trend to, we try to go in order, but we jump around a little bit. Um, trying to hit current and interesting topics that we have not discussed before. Um, so, Chris, why don't you uh, welcome everybody and we'll get started with questions. Okay, thanks and welcome everyone to a uh, live session to go with our uh, now four online astronomy courses, the most recent History and Philosophy of Astronomy on Coursera launched just less than a month ago and I think we're already we're adding about a hundred new people enrolling every week, so it's doing very well. Um, so this is our last live session for the year, for 2022, and the floor is open for your questions. Excellent, thank you. So the first question is from Birhain who asks, um, in your opinion, does the complexity, or what does the complexity of the universe say about the existence of a god or um, other creator, creative force? It's an interesting question, and the, the broad um, envelope for that kind of argument or thinking is called intelligent design, the idea that something sufficiently complex uh, had to involve an intelligent creator. It, it is indeed remarkable that a universe that started from uh, almost a homogeneous state of a super hot, dense plasma of particles and photons could evolve into something with such complex structure, um, the galaxies and the stars they contain, the planets around them, and the biological creatures on those planets at least this one. Uh, so it is remarkable. However, we know through natural law and physical uh, simple laws of physics and evolution over large spans of time that you can develop complexity from simple starting conditions. Well, there are many examples of this in physics and there are examples of this in the universe. So it's not uh, necessarily an argument for an intelligent designer or a creator or a godlike figure that the universe is complex, even the fact that it's highly complex. Um, it's not required by what we see around us. So that's probably the simplest way I'd put it. Rather than denigrating the idea of an intelligent creator or, or a god, I'll just say that the universe that scientists observe does not require that. Uh, the next question is from Demetrius. Um, dear Professor, could you tell us something about the procedure that the International Astronomical Union, or IAU, follows about name-giving new celestial objects? Yes, it's an interesting uh, area of the subject because we discover new things all the time and they have to be named. We'll start close in. Uh, the solar system is the place where the names have been around the longest because many of them, of course, are from myths and legends. And that's still the way things tend to be. Now, some objects can be named after people. If you discover a comet or a big asteroid, uh, you can have it named after you, individual discoverers. But mostly in the solar system, it's named after mythical uh, entities. And then there's even a naming convention there where people have exhausted most of the Greek and Roman deities and they're trying to be a little more even-handed about naming small solar system objects after uh, other myths and legends, say from Norse gods or from Mesoamerica or Africa or Asia. Beyond that, stars tend to get designations that rarely involve names. The brightest stars have names that go back to antiquity because many of them named from Arab countries, and those names are obvious uh, in, the, in the word themselves, uh, deriving from Arabic. But fainter stars simply have number designations, and the numbers essentially denote their positions. And that's the same with galaxies, the largest set of objects in the universe. They tend to have uh, position designators and not actual names. Only very rare and special objects, or perhaps prototype objects, get to be named. And then, again, not usually after their creator, Usually they're given a more neutral designation because astronomers have tried not to be egocentric about how they name things. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from uh, Ragnar, 
who uh, asks, if most cosmologists believe the universe is flat, uh, which implies two dimensions of space, where does the third dimension come in in our reality? So the designation or the description of the universe as flat is a three-dimensional designation. So that, that's the qualification there, that when we talk about a flat universe, we're talking about a flat universe in three dimensions. And what that means is that, for example, if you had light beams traveling through a three-dimensional space like our universe, those light beams, if they started off parallel, would always stay parallel, would never change the distance between them. Whereas if the space was curved, either positively, then those light beams would converge as they pass through the space, or negatively, they would diverge. So you can see the distinction between positive and negatively curved three-dimensional space. But the flat space we have does not refer to the flatness of two dimensions, but refers to flatness in three dimensions. Excellent. Uh, the next question is from Dude, uh, who says, Merry Christmas, everyone. Professor, which universities or labs would you suggest in the U.S. or elsewhere to apply for a Ph.D. in astronomy, especially for research on the origin of life? Well, there are many good astronomy programs at the Ph.D. level. Uh, it does narrow down if you're talking about astrobiology. An astrobiology Ph.D. is still a very unusual entity. I think there's only a handful of places that do that. But there are a larger number that have concentrations or certificates or minors, PhD minors in astrobiology. And the best long-lived program, which has had a certificate for 20 or 30 years now, is the University of Washington in Seattle. And that's a highly recommended program. Um, we also have a concentration in astrobiology at the University of Arizona. Uh, Harvard has one. Uh, MIT, I think, also has one. So there are a number of universities where you can do concentrations in astrobiology. So you really want to look for a university program where the research faculty include more than a handful of astrobiologists. It's pretty unusual to find a lot of astrobiologists in one university department, uh, but there are certainly a number that have more than a couple, and that's what you should be looking for. The next question is from Jerry, who says, Hello from North Florida. Have we found any stars that are diamond in material? Well, the closest to a diamond star is a white dwarf. So the white dwarf is the end state of a star um, that will include the end state of our sun. Uh, a star that's any star that starts its life with uh, less than about one and a half times the mass of the sun will over time lose some mass, natural ejection late in its life. Uh, in the planetary nebula phase, for example. And then the core, when there's no more fusion to support the, uh, the star's extent, will collapse under gravity to form a degenerate state of matter, uh, which is the white dwarf state. Uh, the degeneracy referred to is electron degeneracy. It's a quantum effect where no two electrons can take the same set of quantum properties. And that acts operationally as a pressure. And so it's that pressure that keeps the star from collapsing to an even denser state, like a black hole. So the white dwarf state of an evolved star that's created carbon in its core is strangely similar, perhaps the cousin of diamond, because it's a quasi-crystalline state. However, it's hot, so it's a plasma. So it's not quite the same as a solid, like a diamond. Uh, Pink Floyd made an allusion to this in their song, uh, Shine On You Crazy Diamond. They evidently talked to astronomers and they were making a reference there uh, to white dwarf state. They were also making a reference to the founder member of their group, Sid Barrett, who died had mental illness and a very unhappy later life. Um, and so there's a reference in the popular culture to the white dwarf as a diamond-like state. Uh, the next question, um, it's actually Jerry had a second piece to his question, um, and Jerry would like to know, is there a limit to black hole size? Well, that's an interesting question. We don't quite know the answer. We found black holes in the center of every galaxy we've looked. The Milky Way has a modest one, about four million times the mass of the sun. M87, the image of which their event horizon uh, was displayed from the event horizon telescope a year or so ago, that has a black hole mass of about 6 billion times the mass of the sun. And we think the biggest we've found is about 20 billion times the mass of the sun. So that's the limit observationally that's been discovered so far. And we think it may be close to a natural limit because black holes that form in the center of galaxies can only ever be a certain fraction of the total mass of a galaxy, which might be at the most a trillion times the mass of the sun. 
So it's likely that there is an operational upper bound on a black hole mass around 20 or 30 billion times the mass of the sun. Uh, the next question is from Bernard, who would like to know, um, assuming gravitons are eventually observed, um, can you comment on uh, Professor Claudia de Rom's theory that they might have mass and therefore eliminate the need for dark energy? Well, the idea that gravitons have mass is, is not a standard part of particle physics and not part of the standard structure of physics. So these kind of ideas sort of go beyond the standard model. Uh, the graviton as a particle, as an exchange particle to carry the force of gravity by analogy with photons carrying the electromagnetic force, is an idea that's part of the standard model of particle physics, which we know to be incomplete because it does not include gravity. So if you, in a sense, the, the idea of a graviton is sort of a, an add-on, making it similar to standard particle physics. We haven't detected gravitons. The fact of whether or not they have mass is also up for grabs. And in fact, in standard physics, if they had mass, they wouldn't travel at the speed of light because nothing with mass, uh, an actual mass as a particle, travels at the speed of light. So that would be a problem for the gravity theory. So basically, this is all very speculative physics. Uh, the next question is from an email from Wendy, um, who would like to know, how has the mass of the universe changed, at all, if at all, over its evolution? Well, the mass of the universe has essentially stayed constant because the universe is a sort of a, a closed experiment, if you like, a closed state. Um, whatever energy was present in the initial state, the Big Bang, that energy was interconvertible with mass, and so indeed the energy changed into particles and antiparticles very early on, first fraction of a second. The tiny excess of particles over antiparticles after a big annihilation period uh, left us with the matter in the universe, about 10 to the power 80 particles, uh, mostly hydrogen atoms, of course. And that's the matter content of the universe. And as the universe expands, that matter has just been more diluted uh, through the larger volume of the expanding universe, but it hasn't changed. So as far as we know, the mass of the universe stays constant. The next question is from Pratyush, who asks, is it necessary that a neutron star becomes a magnetar? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, so neutron stars are uh, an extremely dense end state of a star after all fusion is finished. And when the core of the star, the remaining collapsing core, is between about one and a half and about three times the mass of the sun, that formally fits the designation of a neutron star. Essentially, in a reverse process of beta decay, um, electrons and protons are squeezed together to form neutrons. And the neutrons, of course, have no electrical charge, so they can sit as close together, almost touching. And so you have a giant atomic nucleus. That's a neutron star. Now, it's not automatic that the neutron star is going to have a strong magnetic field, and that's what's required to have a magnetar. Stars do have magnetic fields, however, and when the star collapses in its end state, that magnetic field is squeezed by the collapse and so tends to strengthen. Um, so most neutron stars will have strong magnetic fields, but magnetars have magnetic fields that are enormous, like a trillion gauss or even a hundred trillion gauss, and that's an extremely unusual state of a magnetic field for a star. So they seem to be a small fraction of all neutron stars. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is, um, since Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf and a flare star, is it more likely that the atmosphere of Proxima Centauri B uh, would be blown off of it instead of having a planet that is habitable? So this is an important question because um, it's clear now that the, the largest amount of habitable real estate among exoplanets is going to be exoplanets orbiting red dwarfs because there are 100 red dwarfs stars, stars like Proxima Centauri, for every sun-like star. So if we're looking for life in the universe or habitable locations, most of them are going to be around red dwarfs. So Proxima Centauri b is a very interesting case, especially since it's the nearest star. It is true that red dwarf stars have active flares and that radiation could be damaging to life. But it depends on the planet. If the exoplanet is a super-Earth able to hold a thick shielding atmosphere and also has a strong magnetic field to deflect 
uh, radiation from the star, then it's quite plausible that the planet will be able to host life even though that is a flare star. It's only true, however, if the flare star avoids any large excursions in luminosity, because if the flare star changes its brightness by factors of 2, 3, 5, 10, then life is unlikely to be able to survive that. Um, so then in kind of a related question, Jerry, who's on with us live, asks, um, would Sirius going supernova affect Earth? Um, Sirius is not close enough to cause a super big problem for the Earth. Basically, a supernova would have to go off within about 20 light years um, for that to be a problem. I don't remember the distance to Sirius, but I know it's a lot more than 20 light years. So uh, Sirius going off as a supernova would actually be a, a, a hazardous event for the Earth because the radiation environment would change. Um, the DNA mutation rate for land-dwelling organisms would spike. And so there would be some serious problems, but it's not uh, an event that would threaten the entire biosphere. Um, the next question is from Yoga, who's on with us live, who asks, why do protostars emit narrow jet streams, and what is the cause of bipolar flows from protostars? Well, when protostars form, uh, these are regions within dense molecular cloud. Um, which is a very cool cloud with temperatures of 20 to 50 Kelvin that's, that has a large number of, of molecules, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, oxygen, and so on. Uh, when a star forms by gravitational collapse, there's a lot of material nearby, surrounding material. So in addition to the material that goes into this star itself as it switches on fusion, there's a lot of material nearby. Because the star is going to have angular momentum, since the initial angular momentum of the cloud is amplified by collapse, uh, it will have a rotation axis. And it's natural then in an environment where you have a rapidly spinning newly formed star with a lot of debris around it, that material will be able to be accelerated out of the jets or on the polar axis. And so this is a standard phenomenon in physics and its astrophysics is seen in, in other objects that are not protostars. Uh, we've seen these jets now, these bipolar jets of young stars. And they're bright and strong, mostly because there's so much material around when a star forms. Um, the next question is from Pratyush, who asks, what are black hole stars? Black hole stars, as far as I understand the question, are, are simply stars that have lived their lives and died in the black hole end state. And that essentially means typically a star that starts its life eight to ten times the mass of the sun or more, um, a very small fraction of all stars incidentally, uh, and then through its life loses mass and by the end point it leaves behind a core of three or so times the mass of the sun where formally you'll meet the designation of a black hole, of an event horizon, a region from which nothing can escape. Um, the next question is from Jia Li who asks, how would beginners start in observing the night sky, and what equipment uh, does someone need? Well, in the end, you only need a dark sky in your eyeball. Um, so eyes are pretty good, but you need to be beyond city lights. Most uh, people in the world, and most Americans for sure, live in places where there is no dark sky. We live in uh, cities, or actually more people live in suburbs, but suburbs are pretty bright too. So first thing is you need a dark sky. And I don't mean a totally dark desert sky, though that would be nice. I just mean going beyond your city limits, perhaps with a little, now a little mountain range in between you and the city. That's something you can do in Tucson fairly easily, uh, and see the sky. And then naked eye observations are pretty good, good way to start. Binoculars, uh, 30 power, 40 power binoculars, not too, uh, not too expensive because now the, uh, the, the optics are done with plastic and they're pretty high quality. Um, binoculars will be the next step and, and you can do an awful lot before you need to step up to a telescope. As for finding your way in the sky, there's so much online material that it, it's difficult to uh, you know, enunciate what the websites would be, but there are many places that show you what's up in the night sky. You just need to Google that basically. Uh, if you want a magazine that does that, Sky and Telescope or Astronomy Magazine each month say what's visible in the night sky to the naked eye or with binoculars or with a small telescope. 
The next question is from Mark Harding, who's on with us live, who asks, what would be the likely catalyst to initiate life on an exoplanet? The thing that would trigger life on an exoplanet is, of course, not fully known because we don't even know really what happened on the Earth. We know that life happened, of course, and we know that biology spread across this planet pervasively so that after a billion years after the Earth formed, uh, li life was essentially everywhere in the oceans and eventually moved on to land. The trigger on an exoplanet for life would just be the presence of life's ingredients, um, which is water, carbon-based material, and a local energy source. And, and it's really the energy source that's key. Um, you need then a lot of time for complexity to build. So you do need also a stable environment. Uh, some exoplanets have bizarre orbits or extreme variations in temperature, and that would not be conducive to forming biology. Biology, to build the complexity from its simple ingredients to generate the first replicating molecule in the first cell, needs long-term stability, where that means millions of years, not thousands of years. Uh, the next question is from Christina, who sent an email. Um, my question is the following. I find it hard to wrap my mind around the fact that the main asteroid belt is only 4% the mass of the moon. Um, the moon is fairly small. Can you talk about how, whether that's true and how that's possible? Sure. That is a surprising number that people read, and it's true. If you swept up all the asteroids in the asteroid belt, which has some uh, significant radial extent as well, it's not a very thin belt, if you like, or thin region, it's quite wide, it would only be about 4% of the, the mass. I think it's 4% of the mass of the Earth, you need to check that. But it's certainly a small fraction of the mass of a terrestrial planet. The question is, how can that be? Uh, calling it a failed moon or a failed planet is one thing, but how did it get to be such a small fraction of a normal planet? And the answer is that over time, material will scatter out of a region where a planet didn't form. The planet formation process in the solar system was very rapid. It took maybe a few tens of millions of years in a solar system that's four and a half billion years old. So the formation process is quick, and thereafter, material just scatters away or is blown away by radiation pressure from the young sun. So the material in the asteroid belt probably was originally much closer to being sufficient to form a planet. And over time, when that planet just didn't happen to form, uh, material w interacted with other material. There were collisions, and basically it just scattered and dissipated over time. So after four and a half billion years, you see the rather feeble amount of material that's there now. Excellent. And I'm, I did double check it, and it's 3 or 4% the mass of the moon. And there's a Harvard article that says that they essentially, you know, looked at 30 of the largest asteroids and got gravitational, you know, measurements from those. And then everything else is just kind of bits. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is from a live participant. Dude asks, if the atmosphere of a planet gets stripped away by stellar flares, can that planet regain an atmosphere after its parent star ages more and its activity decreases? Um, that's unlikely, actually. So if a planet loses its atmosphere for any particular reason, especially due to the star itself, it's unlikely to regain an atmosphere. The only way that could happen is by accretion from another source. Um, and so it's very unlikely that a planet, which is generally isolated in space, is going to be able to gather gas from anywhere else because in a mature solar system there's no gas left over. The other possible way planets can get uh, atmospheres and gas after it might have been stripped away is from outgassing, from gas released from rocks in the hot interior. And that happened on the Earth and other terrestrial planets, but it happens early on. And mostly it was hydrogen and helium that escaped into space. So when a planet is mature and it's cooled off, it's unlikely that there's going to be enough outgassing from the interior to, to regenerate an atmosphere. Uh, the next question is an email from uh, Ravi, who would like to know, um, it appears that NASA is planning to release all uh, James Webb Space Telescope data immediately, as opposed to giving the selected observers 12 months to analyze and publish their results. Is that the case, and does that seem a little unfair to those who spent years or decades developing the missions, competing for time, waiting for observations? 
It's a good question because this has become a fairly controversial topic in astronomy. And the, and the call is essentially NASA to make with its advisory committees, which include astronomers, of course, and they have some influence. Um, the pressure to release the data quickly is intense because it's so valuable. Remember, this is a $10 billion facility that everyone's been anticipating for decades because it was so long delayed and so over budget. Uh, so everyone wants to get their hands on the data. The only people who have a legitimate claim on privileged access for some period of time are the people who build the instruments that are, enable all the other astronomers to get their results too. And Marcia and George Rieke, two of my colleagues, um, who each are responsible for one of the instruments on James Webb, they're in that category. Now those people got to make their own target list. So those people got to choose their targets for the time that was allocated and preserved for them. So in a sense, they have the inside track there because their time is being used to uh, look at objects that they thought were interesting in the way they wanted to observe them. Given that, it may not be super unfair to make, to, to make the data not proprietary because those groups have been ready to hit the ground running, so to speak. As soon as the telescope was launched and was known to be working properly, they were essentially getting their pipelines ready to reduce the data quickly. And they're also funded by NASA to run this, to their, run their instrument and to get results from it. So it's not that unfair to limit the proprietary time. For other people who get time through peer review in a normal allocation process, it's just the pressure of how the world works that you might have to produce your results quickly. Hopefully it doesn't encourage slipshod or, or, or rapid and error-prone observations and data reductions. Um, I think people will take care and time with the, the James Webb data. Uh, but it is so valuable that the community generally is in favor of having no proprietary period for any of the data. Uh, Pratyush would like to know, do primordial black holes exist? It's not clear. And the windows of possible primordial black hole mass have been mostly ruled out. Primordial black holes are black holes that would have been created in the very early intense phase just after the Big Bang when the pressure and densities were sufficiently high that some very small black holes, very small fraction of the normal stellar mass one, even small fraction of a planet mass, perhaps a, a human mass, a, a hundred kilogram black hole or a kilogram black hole, which of course are the level of tiny subatomic particles. So these are a spectrum of black hole masses far below the mass of normal stellar remnant black holes that could have resulted from the Big Bang. If Hawking radiation exists and Hawking's theories of black hole evaporation are correct, then the smallest of these black holes would have evaporated very early in the universe and long before we existed or the Earth formed or we were here to look at them with our telescopes. So there's only a certain mass range where primordial black holes could still exist in an ancient universe. And most of those mass ranges have now been ruled out observationally. Um, so I think the window of possibility for primordial black holes existing at all is, is diminishing and almost they have been ruled out. Um, Harry Bell, who's on with us live, would like to know, can the axis of rotation of exoplanets be determined by current observations and does this affect the possibility of alien life um, even in a habitable zone? So it's a hard observation. Uh, exoplanet data almost all, always only indicates the mass or size of an exoplanet. And if you had both of those, you could get a mean density. Determining the orbital parameters of an exoplanet beyond its orbital period around the star, that is to say its inclination, uh, that's a more indirect method. But it is possible. So the obliquity of exoplanet orbits, uh, which is their orbital tilt, has been measured in a few dozen cases. Uh, and it, of course, affects everything, just as it does on the Earth. It affects their habitability. It affects the long-term stability of their orbit. Uh, and it's very important data. There's nothing to say that the obliquities or orbital tilts of exoplanets differ from any of the theories or expectations. Uh, the next question is from a live uh, viewer. Vincenti would like to know, we talked about um, Sirius uh, earlier um, and its ability to affect Earth. Um, what about Betelgeuse? Is it close enough to affect the Earth? Should it explode? And are there any, I guess the question more broadly can be, are there, you know, do you know of any stars that are close enough 
um, that are likely to affect Earth that we would be familiar with. Right. Uh, Betelgeuse, the, also the answer is no. I think it's about 1,500 light years away. And although it is an extremely massive star, late in its life, which will die as a supernova, it's also in a regime where it would cause damage to the Earth and life on Earth uh, through radiation, through neutrinos, through cosmic rays, essentially, all bombarding the Earth's atmosphere, but not enough to ablate the atmosphere or destroy the biosphere. Uh, the more general question of are there any stars that are massive enough and close enough that their death could uh, destroy life on Earth, there, is, there are a couple, two or three stars that astronomers have their eyes on. I don't remember their names off the top of my head. Uh, and they are in that category. They're late in their lives. They're, most, they're massive enough that they will die as a supernova. And they're close enough within 20, 25 light years that they could cause real damage to the Earth. As we speak, though, none of them, as well as we can understand their life stage, none of them are close to the end. And by that, it means they could happen in 100,000 or a million years or tens of thousands of years, but it's a very long time compared to a human life. Um, and some of the students looked it up, and apparently Sirius is 8.6 light years away oh, from yeah. Earth, um, and Betelgeuse is 642.5 light years away from Earth. So does uh, the fact that Sirius is 8.6 light years away change your answer at all because it's within that 10 yeah, light years? Yeah, it's, it's Sirius is a, is a hazard, but it's not uh, going to die as the most dramatic form of supernova. So. Uh, and also, we don't think it's that late in its life, so it's a it's a hypothetical risk for some far future generation on the Earth. Excellent, thank you. Um, the next question is from Lawrence K, who would like to know: Is the universe expanding at superluminal speed? Um, there's a place, there's a part of the universe that is expanding at superluminal speed. Uh, early in the history of the Big Bang every point in space was moving away from every other point in space faster than light speed. And that was actually true for the first three or four billion years after the Big Bang. Uh, now, you would not find such a thing until you went out beyond our horizon. So we have a horizon, which is the limit we can see with our telescopes, which is defined essentially by the age of the universe. But there are regions of space in the Big Bang model beyond our horizon where the expansion rate is indeed faster than light, superluminal. So by definition, those are regions of space we will never be able to see, even in the infinite far future if we keep observing. We'll, we'll never see them. They'll never come within our horizon. Uh, John's Garage, who is on with us live, asks, how is it that large hydrogen clouds in space can emit light? Well, um, they don't tend to emit light. The large hydrogen clouds that are in space uh, tend to be very cold. Um, so the, the largest hydrogen clouds that are in the, um, in the centers of galaxies that form stars, they tend to be pretty cold. These are uh, hydrogen, but they also inc include molecules. They're molecular clouds. Uh, they only really emit light or glow when they reach a certain temperature. So hydrogen will start to glow when it reaches a temperature of a few thousand Kelvin. And then we see it glowing in the, in the transitions of the hydrogen atom in the Balmer series and the Lyman series and so on. And H alpha is the strongest line uh, that hydrogen emits. It's a pink line because its uh, wavelength is uh, 6,500 angstroms. So that's what it'll take to make hydrogen glow. It has to be heated up somehow, and that will happen in a region where stars are forming. There's also extremely large hydrogen clouds in intergalactic space. And ironically, although deep space is mostly cold, the temperature of the microwave background, 3 degrees Kelvin, the radiation from stars and galaxies keeps that very thin plasma in intergalactic space extremely hot, temperature of 100,000 or a few million Kelvin. And so that hydrogen uh, doesn't emit light, but it actually has a weak glow in X-rays and far ultraviolet radiation. Um, Alan asks, why would plasma not be transparent to photons, but, or I guess, why do plasma and gas respond differently to photons? So plasma is composed of charged particles, but photons don't have charge. So why is it that plasmas and gases respond differently to photons? Right. The difference is really because in a plasma, um, almost by definition, it's what a plasma is. 
the electrons have been stripped from the nuclei. So assuming it's hydrogen, that's very simple. That's just electrons and protons. And they're bouncing around at very high energy and high speeds and a high temperature. So in a plasma, when the electrons are not attached to, to their nuclei, to their protons, um, there's a very efficient mechanism for absorbing and scattering light called electron scattering. So basically the electrons intercept, scatter, and absorb photons, and that's what makes a plasma opaque to light. Uh, as soon as the gas is cool enough to no longer be a plasma, which means the electrons reattach to the nuclei and they become just plain hydrogen atoms, they clearly occupy a much smaller space. The electrons are not careening around, bouncing into things, and so they present no obstacles to the light, and the light passes through and the gas becomes transparent. Excellent. Uh, the next question is from Dude again, who asks, does being tidally locked with its parent star dramatically reduce the possibility of life on a planet, or could there still be a reasonable chance for it? This is a very, a, a field that's under great debate in the astrobiology community, because there are a lot of exoplanets that are going to be tidally locked. There's a lot of, of course, hot Jupiters and close-in planets that are tidally locked, but there are also exoplanets around uh, um, red dwarf stars that are close in if they're in the habitable zone and they will be tidally locked too. So with all these tidally locked planets, the question of whether it's habitable is, is very hard to answer. Uh, if the planet has a thick atmosphere uh, there will and some rotation uh, and some heat gradient, which is almost by definition when it's close to a star, then the heat gradient will drive uh, convection and winds which will tend to equalize the temperature. So even in a tidally locked exoplanet, uh, it's not that the, f the face that's facing the star has an incredibly high temperature and the face that's facing away from the star has an incredibly low temperature. There's equalization of the temperature at some level, depending on the circulation pattern. So people think that may allow the possibility for life. Um, but it's a completely open question. It's an active research question. Of course, we haven't found life on any exoplanet at all, so the question of the tidally locked ones is a sort of sub-culture uh, of the exoplanet question. Uh, the next question is from the 800 millimeter Telescope Project, um, who asks, uh, Hello, Professor, can you explain why the Cepheid mechanism um, make them such a reliable candle? So Cepheid variables, um, there, there are a lot of variable stars in, in the range of stars. There's dozens of actually different types of variables where the mechanisms, the masses uh, vary and the frequencies of the variation, or some are regular and some are irregular. Cepheids are valuable because they're luminous stars with highly regular variability. Uh, and that's important for cosmology because it means they can be seen at large distances and the fact that the variability period is coupled to luminosity in a linear way, a correlation, means they can be, their luminosities can predict, be predicted measuring their period. The question of why there is a periodicity is basically a thermostat mechanism. In some pulsating stars you have a situation where the nuclear fusion rate is not completely steady, and when the fusion rate increases, it puffs up the star, lowers the temperature, which shuts off the fusion to some degree, allows the star to collapse again, the star heats up, and the process repeats. So it's almost like an oscillation. It's almost like a mechanical oscillation, but it's driven by a change in the fusion rate of the star, and that leads to a periodicity. Mr. P, who's on with us live, asks, how are astronomers reacting to the recent fusion news from the National Ignition Facility? and what policies will result from our possible need to mine the moon for helium-3? I'll treat those as two separate questions since they're really quite different. Um, as for the recent fusion result uh, from Livermore Lab, that's very exciting. The laser ignition facility uh, achieved a net positive energy from 192 laser beams focusing in on a target um, and creating an instant of fusion. And that's the first time that's been seen, a sort of a sustainable net positive energy coming out. But it is so far from uh, a steady reactor. I mean, think of the sun. The sun effortlessly converts 10 ocean liners worth of mass into 
uh, hydrogen into helium and releases energy in that sunlight that keeps all life on Earth alive. And it's done it for five billion years and it'll do it for another four billion years. How far are we from replicating that energy output and stability uh, in the lab? Enormously far. And most practitioners and uh, theorists and physicists have said this is decades, decades away from anything remoting, remotely approaching a viable reactor, which of course has to be cost effective too. Just getting the energy out in a net positive way when it requires enormous and expensive orchestration of matter and infrastructure to get that result will disadvantage it from wind or solar or, or, um, ac or high geothermal power, for instance. So I think as a viable option for humans to wean themselves from carbon-based fuels, it's not really going to help us. And of course, it's not going to help us on the time scale we need help. We're going to have to go some other route. As for the policies that allude to mining of, on the moon, helium-3, for instance, is a valuable resource because helium-3 is, a, is, a, is an intermediate stage into the fusion of helium from hydrogen in the sun. Uh, helium fusion is a three-step process, and uh, the second stage of the process produces helium-3, and the third stage takes two helium-3s, uh, combines them to make a helium-4, and releases two protons to continue future reactions. So helium-3 is a valuable commodity because it's, it's, n it's implicated in any simple fusion reaction, and it, it of course, it leads you, takes you to the last stage of that reaction as opposed to starting you at the first stage when you just have protons. So it's a pretty valuable resource. It's pretty rare as well, that isotope. Um, there is no governing rule or body over mining the moon for that resource or for any resource, really. It's the same. No government owns the moon. No private company owns the moon. It's sort of first come, first serve. Um, and so, unfortunately, we're setting up a situation of a Wild West. At the moment, it's punitively expensive to go to the moon and mine anything. So that prospect, I think, is still decades away when we'll have to really think about a solution to that issue. Um, the next question is from Arnab, who asks, do we know what the trigger was for the Big Bang from the singularity which was prevailing at the time? No, we don't. We don't know why the Big Bang happened, and we don't know what caused it, if you like. Um, and there's just speculation, therefore. The speculation revolves around the fact that there was a precursor state which allowed quantum fluctuations, um, uh, small regions of space-time to come in and out of existence, to borrow energy from the vacuum that could drive expansion, and that if that happened in one location or at one time, it could happen elsewhere. Um, so that, that would just put the Big Bang into a realm where there are other events, analogous or similar or even dissimilar, but starting as singularities and growing space-times from there. Uh, but there's no evidence to support that, and there's really no clear prediction from that idea. So at the moment, it is simply beyond cosmology to talk about what caused the Big Bang. The Big Bang model is an explanation that works very well about the evolution of the universe from a singularity or an extremely hot, dense state. It doesn't describe why it happened. Uh, the next question is from Holden, who asks, do you think it's more likely to find signs of past or present life on Mars under the surface or in Enceladus's ocean floors? Well, it's a hard question to answer. I mean, I think there's significant chance of finding existing biology in both places. We know that Mars was warmer and wetter in the past, but that's billions of years ago. But we also know that there's almost certainly likely, uh, there's almost certainly subsurface aquifers uh, around Mars where there's liquid water right now and local energy source, and so there could be biology there if those are long-lived and stable. Um, Enceladus, yes, also is producing liquid water in its interior. And so basically anywhere in the solar system that you have liquid water, carbon-rich material, some degree of stability in a local energy source, you could have biology. And so they're, they're almost equal in that regard. Uh, the next question is from Pramod, who asks, um, the names of the constellations seem antiquated. To make astronomy accessible to common people, why not rename them like pizza constellation or chair constellation? 
I mean, it's a good idea, and I've, I've seen it done humorously, you know, so there are cartoonists that have taken this on. There are some astronomers in their popular writing that have speculated this way. It's, but it's not a bad idea. The constellations are, uh, are do indeed date from antiquity, some of them even before um, the Greek and Roman civilizations going back to Egyptian or Babylonian times. So the modern constellations, 110, uh, denoted by the International Astronomical Union, the good majority of those have are designations that go back at least hundreds of years and maybe thousands. And you absolutely could invent your own and make a plausible case for them. But the adjudication of that would have to be done in social media and in the online culture of the world. Uh, the International Astronomical Union, unfortunately, has not shown any sign they want to rename the constellations. The next question is from uh, Ellensburg, Washington, who's on with us live, who asks, uh, now that we know that terraforming Mars is close to impossible, why have a space program to establish settlements on Mars when we could use the money to lower the carbon footprint on Earth? Well, that's a good point, and it's, a, an, you know, it's essentially an impossible question to answer because the people who decide they want to go to Mars are doing it for its own reasons and they don't view it as a zero-sum game. They might think we do need to take care of the Earth, uh, but this is something else. And if they're spending their own personal private capital on it, it's hard to argue with them. Billionaires can essentially do what they want with their money. Uh, so yes, it would be better to take care of the Earth, especially with taxpayer money and government resources around the world. But private investors have decided they probably want to go to Mars, Elon Musk most prominent among them. Uh, it will be a very expensive, very difficult endeavor. It won't really help us back here on Earth. But even though it's hard, it's probably going to happen. Government going to Mars uh, is less easier to justify because the governments do need to make the hard choice of how to spend that money. Uh, the next question is from Joshua Dillard who asks, can you speak on, uh, to talk about why the moon experiences the opposite of orbital decay? I've read that the moon moves further from the Earth every year. Right, so the Earth uh, and the moon are in a, you know, locked in an embrace, a gravitational embrace. Um, and, and as you know, the moon is tidally locked, so the moon always presents one face to the Earth. So there's a gravitational coupling between the moon and the Earth. They're both also spinning objects. So what happens is the energy in a binary system like Earth-Moon system is conserved, uh, and the angular momentum is conserved, but it can still change hands. And so what we have is a situation where the influence of the Moon is gradually slowing down the Earth, reducing its orbital angular momentum and its orbital energy, and going into an increased gravitational energy of the Moon by its increasing distance from the Earth. So the Moon is simultaneously slowing the Earth down very slightly in its orbit and moving very slightly away from the Earth every year. I think the number is about four centimeters a year. The next question is from Prof's Choice, who's on with us live. What factors cause planetary migrations within a relatively stable star system? And is it possible that there, or is there any evidence that this may have occurred within our solar system? So planetary migration uh, can happen uh, always or any time there's an external influence. So even though the system may be stable, um, it can be suffer an influence from outside. So the passage of a nearby star can disrupt the orbit sufficient to cause a planet to move in. Um, and, that, and that may be the most common way that it happens. Uh, the other way that it can happen is from resonance. So when the planet's in a, in a star system, uh, enter an orbital resonance where the orbital period of one of the planets is an even number ratio with the orbit of another planet, then you have a, a resonance, which is a sort of enhancement of the orbital energy in a nonlinear way, and that can lead the planet to migrate, also can lead the planet to sometimes be ejected. So migration can go inward or outward. Um, so that's how we think migration happened. And yes, there is evidence that the early solar system was unstable and that the positions of the giant planets moved around substantially. Um, the next question is from Yoga, who's on with us live. Um, what is the cause of the explosion in a supernova explosion? 
is there any kind of powerful final explosion or is it some um, rebound mechanism of the outer layers of the dying star yes it's it's a it's a conservation of energy as the star collapses so when the energy source from fusion is finally exhausted and then supernova that's typically when the core of the star has created iron iron is the most stable element and so energy is no longer gained from the fusion process uh, then that is not a net energy gain and so the core must collapse the gravitational collapse of the core uh, indeed leads to a bounce so the n not all the material can squash into that tiny amount of space now within that at the very center of the core you may form a black hole or a neutron star but all that material can't keep in falling into a tiny space and so eventually it bounces and the outrushing material traveling at nearly the speed of light meets the material further out that's still in falling and the result is a blast wave um, and that blast wave can reach temperatures of several billion degrees Kelvin or billion Kelvin and that's where s nuclear synthesis explosive nuclear synthesis occurs so it's a, an extremely dramatic event and yes the bounce phase literally takes a fraction of a second. Um, the next question is from Gene, um, who's on with us live, who asks, um, how far do you need to be from a black hole to be able to orbit it but not fall in? Well, the event horizon is obviously the point of no return, so that's the place um, where you do not want to be because essentially the gravity inexorably will pull you in and there's no escape. Um, there's this, and that's distance, that radius is called the Schwarzschild radius, that's the distance of the event horizon from the center. At a distance twice that number, there actually is a stable orbit, uh, and that's the innermost stable orbit formally in general relativity, so twice the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, and it's called, and it's a photon sphere. You could essentially have a photon, not just an orbit, a, a particle or a spacecraft or something like that, but you can have a photon that's literally in orbit around a black hole, um, which is a kind of bizarre concept. But that's how close you can get. Um, the next question is from Raccoon28. How do different wavelengths of light form? Like when are microwaves and when are radio waves emitted? So the creation of electromagnetic radiation is, is essentially coupled to their energy, their wavelength and their frequency. Those are all interrelated. So let's, fundamentally it's about the energy though. So if you want to make a photon or electromagnetic wave of a particular energy, you have to have that energy liberated somehow. And then when that energy is liberated in a mechanism that relates to the electromagnetic force, then you can have an electromagnetic wave. And so it's governed by energy. And the lowest energies are, of course, radio waves and microwaves, and the highest energies are x-rays and gamma rays. So when you have free energy in any exchange or any interaction, that free energy could come out or manifest as radiation of a particular kind. It also couples to temperature. So thermal radiation, the temperature of any object, directly relates through Bean's law uh, to the wavelength of the maximum radiation that that body emits. Uh, an object like the Earth uh, with a temperature of a few hundred Kelvin is emitting primarily infrared radiation into space. Uh, a glowing filament of a light bulb or a, a star has a photosphere temperature of thousands of Kelvin and that's emitting optical light. And then once you get up to temperatures of hundreds of thousands or millions of degrees, the natural radiation coming out is x-rays. Um, Bernard asks, um, and this is related to an earlier question about gravitons, I think, um, do gravitational waves and therefore gravitons travel at the speed of light or a bit slower, which could be caused by their mass? Well, gr uh, gravitational waves uh, in the theory of general relativity, they're a prediction of general relativity, and they've now been observed for the last five years with LIGO and other instruments. Um, they are, in the theory, prescribed to move at the speed of light, and they are essentially not mass objects at all. They're perturbations in space-time or disturbances in space-time. So gravitational radiation is a space-time disturbance propagating at the speed of light. The gravity of an object 
may or may not be propagated by gravitons. And in the modern world of particle physics, in the standard model, that uh, exchange carrier uh, would not have a mass because that would violate one of the principles of the standard model of particle physics, which is why some people think gravitons is a sort of obsolete concept because a final and superior theory of gravity will make them uh, will remove the need for that description. Um, and so is that why, or can you explain a little bit about why gravitons, as you said before, don't really fit the standard model? Gravitons don't fit the standard model because the standard model of particle physics is really only there to describe uh, three of the forces of nature. The electromagnetic force, uh, where the entity in the standard model is the photon. Uh, the weak nuclear force, where the entities in the standard model are the W and the Z bosons, three of them. And the strong nuclear force, where the entities in the standard model are quarks, uh, six different flavors in pairs. That's the standard model in a nutshell, and gravity is not a part of it. So gravity is just not included in the standard model. It functions at a, at a long-range scale, of course, and at a very much weaker strength than all the forces of the standard model. So it's just never been part of the theoretical apparatus. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so it is uh, 11 o'clock here in Tucson. We're going to take one more question since we started a little bit late. Um, but this will be the last one for today, and then we'll wish you a happy Christmas, a happy holiday season. Um, Jerry would like to know, is Titan too cold for life? Uh, could life evolve from natural gases like methane and ethane on another planet? So we don't know if Titan is too cold for life or, or really too strange for life in a chemical sense. Um, I don't think we'd say is too cold for life because uh, life only requires the creation of complexity from simple chemical ingredients and then the ability for them to hold and transmit information. That's what genetic material does and that's what is eventually done in a cell. Um, so while Titan is very cold and indeed the liquids uh, involved are ethane and methane for the most part with a little water, a little ammonia, uh, at that temperature Pure water would, of course, be ice, and pure ammonia would also be a solid. So it's only the fact that ethane and methane have extremely low uh, freezing points that they can be a liquid. But given that they are a liquid, they have the ability to facilitate chemical interactions. And that's the primary requirement for the formation of life, whether it happens in a, in a sort of balmy pond on the Earth or in a frigid lake of ethane and methane on Titan. the basic requirement is the same and the ingredients are just different. So we don't know if there's life on Titan, uh, but the temperature itself does not rule it out. It may mean that the formation of complex molecules take place more slowly or the evolution of complexity happens more slowly, but it, it doesn't rule it out. What's m trickier is to figure out whether those chemical ingredients can ever generate long chain molecules that can store information, because that does seem to be a requirement for biological life as we understand it. Thanks very much. A lot of good questions, cosmology to exoplanets to, um, to, to all sorts of things in between. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you on these Q&A sessions through the years. And this is our last one for 2022, so we'll see you in 2023. Thanks to Matthew for helping with the session. And uh, everyone, have a happy holiday season. Excellent. And if you have time over the holidays, uh, make sure you check out our new course, which is called Knowing the Universe. And it's about the history and philosophy of astronomy. Um, we are proud of it and think that it's turned out well. Uh, have a great uh, rest of the week and weekend. Take care, everybody.